It's such a, it's very sunny up here. <laughs> I should have worn my sunglasses. Um, I'm going to talk with you a few uh, minutes today, maybe about 15 minutes or so, uh, sort of extemporaneously. Um, I'm looking around the room and I see a lot of people here in front of me who have had very full lives with a lot of experiences in them. And I know that you have experienced both, I'm sure, tremendous successes and joys in your life and, and you've also faced some of the some of the more difficult issues in life, uh, especially when it comes to caring for your loved one with frontal temporal dementia and other forms of dementia. I was very touched by Dr. Dan Godlieb's talk, as I know many of you were today, and I was particularly excited to follow his presentation because my, my talk is really a lot about community and our place uh, in the community and how we can use community to deal with the issues that you're dealing with and caring for your loved ones. Uh, you know, no matter what your politics are, when Hillary Clinton says it really takes a, a village to raise a child, I, I think it takes a village to care for some of our um, elders who are faced with chronic uh, conditions such as frontal temporal dementia, Alzheimer's disease. And I'm very pleased to be a part of the Alzheimer's Association because we spend our life uh, in service to the community uh, because, as Dr. Grossman said, uh, we really can be gatekeepers for uh, information for you, referrals for you, and support for you as you um, go along this journey. Uh, sometimes you feel like you're alone. You aren't. There are people out there that can help you. Uh, so you want to rely first on your internal resources. I mean, those of us who have lived very full life and we've hit the highs and we've hit the lows, uh, we know that things are cyclical and uh, that we have uh, triumphed over some very difficult situations in life. And so don't think about your inner strengths and your gifts and your talents uh, first when you think about coping with frontal temporal dementia. And then from that point, uh, I, I th and one more point about that. I, I think that sometimes when we're caregivers for people with dementia, we don't, we don't get a lot of thank yous. Um, so we have to think about ourselves um, in terms of what we're doing right instead of what's going wrong and give ourselves a pat on the back and be very gentle with ourselves because uh, the way you feel about yourself really, really has a huge impact on your ability to provide um, quality care and, of course, the quality of your own life. Aside from what you're bringing to this situation personally, your strengths, your gifts, your talents, uh, your hopes, as well as, you know, your fears and, and um, all those things that make us who we are, what you have to do is to create a plan. And that plan needs to include other people. I think we've mentioned this in several different ways today. Uh, you cannot take care of somebody with frontal temporal dementia 24 hours a day, every day of the year by yourself. No matter how much you love them, no matter how capable and intelligent you are, no matter how many successes are under your belt, you're going to need help. And the sooner you start working on that plan, the better. You're here today, so you've taken the first step in creating your plan, and I'm sure some of you have taken many other steps as well. But educating yourself is the key, the foundation to providing good care and caring for yourself. So congratulations once again to all of you who are here today to learn more about this, even though I know it hurts for some of you to be here today. Uh, I sniffled along with you when we had Dr. Dan Gottlieb here talking, I know the pain that's in your heart. Um, so educating yourself is the first step in, uh, in an understanding and building a plan. Second of all, tell others what is happening to you. So many people call our helpline, and I'll talk a bit more about our services in a minute, but so many people, 7,000 or more, call our helpline a, a day, a, a day, a year. <laughs> it's busy, but not quite that busy. <laughs> Thank goodness. Um, 7,000 7, people call a year. We get to hear a lot of stories um, from, from people. Uh, don't be afraid to tell others. So many people tell us that they feel stigmatized by this and that they, don't, they do want to protect the children and they don't want to ask their friends and they're ashamed to tell their neighbors. 
when I have a problem, uh, if it's work-related or family-related, I tell everybody. I never know where the answer will lie. And some of the most unexpected people come up with the resources that I didn't even know existed. So please don't be ashamed of what's happening to your family. Please do tell everyone. If, you're, if you are living in a neighborhood and your loved one wanders away and you're the only one who knows to watch out for him or her, your chances of catching them in the block, at the, in the block somewhere is, are not good. The further they get for that block, the less known they are your chances of finding them will be less and less. If Tell your neighbors and your friends what's happening. Tell the folks at your house of worship. Um, in the book, uh, uh, What If It's Not Alzheimer's Disease, which um, Lisa Radin and her son Gary Radin edited, there's a chapter in the book that's written by Helen Ann Comstock, and I hope she won't mind me telling you about it. I'm, I'm sure some of you bought the book today, I know, and you're going to be reading about it anyway. Helen Ann decided to throw a cocktail party for all of her friends uh, and to tell them about her husband's um, uh, Pick's disease. And um, she passed out flyers about it in order to educate them. And then she asked for their support. Not everybody supported her. We heard some stories about that today. That's hurtful, yes, but there's nothing you can do about that if somebody is not willing to open their heart and help you. Uh, it, I'm sure that Helen Ann uh, cites in her book that a number of people stepped forward and asked her, what can I do for you? When someone steps forward and asks you, what can I do for you? Please be ready to tell them what it is you need. So make a list. At the Alzheimer's Association, we have a list available for you, uh, 101 things to do for an Alzheimer's uh, patient family. Okay, it said Alzheimer's in it, but frontal, substitute the word frontal temporal dementia person. Uh, there are things that you can ask people to do. Maybe it's hard for them to bathe or toilet someone, so they might not be the direct care provider, but like we said today, can they shop for groceries? Um, you know, can they uh, take to the doctor? You know, there are a lot of ways to provide help. Not everybody's comfortable. So tell everybody what it is they can do for you and then take them up on it. If they don't call you back to offer again, say, call them and say, look, I know you said you were going to help. You have to be an advocate for yourself and your loved one. They're not able to do that anymore. Lots of people want to help, but they don't want to interfere. I mean, there are all kinds of barriers to this. Please look on it as your job to be assertive with them as an advocate for your loved one and the best caregiver you can be because if you don't take care of yourself by utilizing the services of an informal support system, you will not be well soon. And then if you have isolated yourself from everyone else, where will your loved one be? Building. An informal support system is putting a safety net under you and your loved one. None of us is immortal. What if something happens to us and we haven't built a safety net for our loved one that can support them later on? What if nobody else knows about them? What if no one knows how to take care of them but you? That's not, that's not good. That's not a good plan. You want to tell others. You want to get others involved. You want to write down who's doing what when. Uh, you want to leave some notes about, you know, what, what is good care. Um, some people don't want to have a co may not want to have a cocktail party and tell everybody about it, but how about writing them letters or emails or having a smaller family type of a meeting or a neighbor's meeting or something like that. Um, ask for help. Um, and be sure to thank people for that help as well. People that are acknowledged for the help they give tend to give again, so don't forget about that. When we talk about help, first we're, we're talking about what we can do with ourselves, what we can do with our family, what can we do with our uh, house of worship, what about our civic organizations, what about our legislators. Let's not forget about talking to our legislators about this. Uh, the Alzheimer's Association is very, very involved in talking with our legislators about Alzheimer's disease and other related dementia processes. And the fact that we need research dollars for a cure so that future generations don't have to live with 
uh, the problems that you are all living with right now. Um, not only are we asking for money for research, we're also asking money for care, which benefits you today. In fact, on Tuesday, I will be in Harrisburg along with a number of other people uh, from our chapter, a number of involved caregivers as well, and advocates from across the state of Pennsylvania, and we will be asking for an increase in the Family Caregiver Support Program, which will allow more respite dollars for people. Uh, and this is the only program that supports people under the age of 60 because, as you know, our Department of Aging doesn't generally have a lot of funding for people who are not considered aged. And you know, people with frontal temporal dementia, they not, may not be over 60, but they are facing a lot of the issues that older people do face. So we're going to Harrisburg uh, this uh, Tuesday on the 15th, and we go every spring to Washington. And in between, we visit our senators and representatives. Now, I know you're caregivers, and you may be very busy in providing care, but we can put you on an e-alert uh, system. We can uh, alert you when bills are coming up that we would like for you to email your senator or your congressperson and um, call them or write a letter to them or whatever is an appropriate form of uh, communication for you so that we can have a voice and begin to make a difference on a larger scale. So as you can see, building a network goes further and further and further away. I'm talking about not only the microcosms of our family, but the macrocosms of our, um, of our uh, legislative and governmental systems. Uh, I, and besides looking at informal supports, I want you to consider using formal supports. Uh, formal supports are supports that are uh, given to you through professional services, and we covered a few of them today very briefly, but adult day services. I was an adult day provider for 12 years before I became uh, involved with the Alzheimer's Association. A very, very important service because it allows a person to have their own life during the day and make new friends and use their social skills while they're getting their meds on time and they're eating properly and they're exercising and they're doing artwork and they're having pet therapy and there's music and things that you can't provide in your own home are provided there because there's a staff of people working on it and you're only one person. While they're away, you're getting support. Um, excuse me, you're getting respite and, and that is supportive. So it's a very important concept and one that I believe in very strongly. Uh, I think that you ought to look into it. At the association, we have a list of questions that you can go out when you ask, when you visit an adult program, adult day service program, um, that you can judge, it, is this a quality service? We also have county by county lists uh, of adult day, as well as in-home service programs, uh, overnight respite facilities, and uh, more supportive living environments, which you know may be options later that are considered uh, when, when people get into later stages. Sometimes uh, assisted living is uh, something that people opt for and or nursing home care uh, in cases where there are medical issues as well. So all of this information is available to you at the Alzheimer's Association and also how to choose these services. What makes a service a quality service? What questions shall I ask when I go there? What shall I look for? And then you think about, is it close to my home? Can I, you know, can I, can I get there easily? Uh, does, are the people there really nice that take care of my loved one? Because that's the most important thing. If you get the right match, uh, it's almost like an extended family for your, for your loved ones. Uh, I, I know that that's how it was in my, in my daycare center that I worked in. Uh, our staff really, really loved and cared for those people that we, that we served. And they taught us so much. Uh, I did go to you know, college and, and, and higher education, but I got my real education from people with dementia. They shared the most difficult things in their, the most difficult times in their life with me and made me a better person. So if you think that, that their life cannot make a contribution still, you're wrong because I built my life on their life and they were very, very influential to me. So hiding your person with dementia away and keeping them to yourself may not be a service to your community either. I wouldn't know half of what I know about people with dementia if I weren't enabled to work with them 10 to 12 hours a day. 
And so I, I would love for you to consider it from my point of view as well. Keep having them out in society, using their voices in advocacy work. Uh, I did an early stage panel at, um, at a large national conference and I had three people uh, with early onset uh, and early stage dementia on, on stage talking about their experiences and I interviewed them and their caregivers and it was one of the most moving and instructive things. Uh, I, th I think almost on the par of Dr. Dan's uh, talk today. People laughed, they cried, and, and it wasn't because of me, it was because these people sharing their fabulous insights and, um, and some of the joys as well as some of the sorrows that go along with the journey. So we want to have other people understand what's going on. I want you to be able to take a look at, um, at uh, getting your person involved, getting your loved one involved in services, and, and making your voice heard and becoming active. You know what makes us feel helpless and hopeless? It's when we feel we can't do anything about what's happening. When we can push back, that's when we begin to feel better. When we have a plan, that's when we begin to feel better. And so I invite you to join uh, the Alzheimer's Association and our wonderful partners here at the conference and the U of Penn and, um, and the Frontal uh, Temporal Association for Frontal Temporal Dementia in uh, getting involved with us. Um, and that can mean, you know, serving us in, in ways of volunteering and t making your stories known and that sort of thing, but also getting involved um, in our service constellation which I am very proud to say, uh, I am debuting our core program and service video today that our chapter has been planning for many, many years. And we finally found a funding source. And uh, this is its public debut to today. So I hope you enjoy it. It's a lot about what's available to us. And if I could just point out one main thing about the um, film that you're about to see. If you take nothing else away from the film, I'd love for you to take our 800 number because from our 800 number, you can get involved with our support group system, which by the way, Lisa Radin runs a fabulous frontal temporal support group um, here in the area in Radnor. We have a number of early stage and early onset and spousal support groups. Uh, African American and Spanish language and Korean language and general support groups as well, 170 in the Delaware Valley area in, in communities um, everywhere. Uh, also our family caregiver support program, uh, it is, uh, the medical piece really focuses a bit more on Alzheimer's disease than may be appropriate for this group, but as you can hear today, there's a lot of overlap uh, when we talk about um, these different types of diseases, but a, a lawyer talks about um, a lawyer talks about what the financial ramifications of the disease are and how to prepare. Social workers and nurses talk about behavior communication. I mention this to you because it's free. It's an eight-hour comprehensive training, and if you are having difficulties with your family members getting on the same page. It's a wonderful thing to invite the whole family to this, and at least you have a foundation of support for discussion in the future. Uh, this is, these are disease processes that can tear families apart, and this is the way to unify them through education. It's a beginning step, so you'll see it in the video. And I'm just gonna go ahead and ask uh, our wonderful technician, Ray, if he could put up the debut performance of our probation. So if you don't live in this area, there's an Alzheimer's Association near you and we would be happy to point you in the direction of your uh, local chapter as well. These are only, these are our core services and they're available um, at, at all the chapters across the country. So uh, I think that this is pretty applicable um, even if you aren't from the local